Good afternoon where you are, good morning where I am and a couple of my colleagues at the RBL Group. What a privilege to welcome you into my home office. This is, uh, this is where I work, this is my home and like you, I've been sheltered at home now for a month. Uh, we get out some but we are pretty in, uh, locked in here. Uh, this working at a distance is both good news and bad news. It's bad news that I'm not with you in purpose, in person as I have been in the past. The good news is that through the gift of technology, we can connect. And memory, thank you for hosting this and for setting it up. Um, the one advice is if you're not on mute, if you could go on mute, that helps the rest of us understand. I'm gonna talk today about the future of business and HR in this post COVID-19 world. I'm gonna start where I'm gonna end. And I put this slide up and we'll spend just a minute telling you some of my assumptions. One of the questions I always get is, can I get a copy of the slide? And the answer is absolutely. Note down this email, gbitter at rbl.net is my assistant. I encourage you to send her a note and give a little bit about your background. And we would be delighted to send you a copy of the slides and any other information. And then don't hesitate to go to rbl.net to uh, pick up some tools. So, and, and I'd love you to follow me on LinkedIn if you have, if you have the energy and time. Um, but I want to begin so that please look at that email because it's the question I most often get and look at the tools that we have. Let me tell you where we're going today. And we have a lot to cover, a lot to cover. So I'm going to really blitz through six issues. But here's the message. I want to give you some ideas that will have impact on how HR creates and delivers value in Zimbabwe, how HR creates and delivers value in Europe, in Latin America, in the United States. What's HR's role at creating value in this incredible crisis? I'm gonna start with a fundamental assumption of what that means, then I'm gonna go into COVID-19, and then I'm gonna look at three things, the management of paradoxes, looking at accident logic as a metaphor, and then three deliverables where we deliver value. And I know in Zimbabwe that a lot of the HR work has been focused on administrative things, but what can we do to deliver value? And then I'm gonna end with some suggestions of the actions we take. Again, I warn you that this is a lot of material. Uh, I know you may want a copy of the slides, write down ginger, G bitter at RBL, and don't hesitate to go to our website for more information. I also have, we have online a couple of the consultants from our firm, um, and they may uh, add into what we say. If you have questions, use the chat box, and I'll stop once in a while, and memory will filter those. Or um, if you have questions, when we stop, I'll try to get your questions. So let's start with a fundamental assumption. What's the most important thing HR can give an employee? What a simple question. You know, here's the answers we often get. Meaning, purpose, belonging, a chance to learn, a chance to grow, a paycheck, a job, a relationship. Yes, 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 yes. And not yes. Here's the fundamental assumption. It's the mental model, the unconscious bias in our minds. I believe the most important thing we can give an employee is an organization that succeeds in the marketplace. Until and unless we succeed in the marketplace and we help our company win in the marketplace where we are, either in retail or transportation or lodging or manufacturing, until we succeed in the marketplace, there is no workplace. And so the passion that I wanna get out is the value we create is not about the activities that we do, it's about our ability to be successful in the marketplace. We call that an outside-in logic. What does that mean? Who are the customers or shareholders or stakeholders of HR? Interesting question. Who are the customers of HR? Generally, the answer is below the line. Our customers are our employees. Our customers are our line managers. Those are inside the organization. We want to focus outside. And in everything we do, what we do inside should be connected to that which occurs outside with the real customers of my company, with the investors, with the communities, with our partners. 
when we make HR connected inside to the outside, that's where our value begins to get created. And with my colleagues on the call today, Jessica and Michael, we work constantly at that outside in. Um, for example, we teach a course at the University of Michigan, and we often start by saying, what did, why are you coming to this course in HR for two weeks? I want to learn about culture. I want to learn about succession planning. I want to learn about compensation. Great ideas. And then we tell people to do a simple exercise. So that. So that. I want to learn about culture, something below the line in our company, so that we can better serve our customers, so that our investors pay a premium for our stock or a discount for debt. I want to learn about how to build succession planning so that our leaders will be the right leaders to serve our customers. All of the things we do in HR, again, should be connected to success in the marketplace. That's my first assumption. That's my first bullet. So what does that mean about COVID-19 and our response? Given the assumption that HR is not about HR, but about creating value for others, we got to start with the context. Here's one of my favorite lines. Content is king. Context is the kingdom. The context is the setting in which we work. And understanding that context or the kingdom in which we operate, we know the environmental conditions that shape our work. So in our world, we have often looked at uh, uh, World of Work 2.0, the future of Work 2.0, or 3.0, or 4.0. Everybody likes to add a point oh. And in our work, we look at traditionally six dimensions of the future of work that shape our work. Social, what's happening with the, the social trends that affect the, uh, the life and the world in which we operate. Technical, and I should bullet that in big, bold, light yellow letters, the digital technology, the economic trends, competition across cycles, the political trends that happen in every country, including Zimbabwe and the United States, the environmental trends that we're facing today around social responsibility and demographic trends. In traditional HR work, we look at those six trends and we say, what are the implications? That happened until about January this year. And then this is what began to happen. In January, these headlines begin to show up. Um, I could add a lot more. I didn't pull any out of Zimbabwe, but I'm sure if I looked in your media, boom, there's a shock, there's a jolt. This coronavirus that nobody expected, it was not an expected trend in these trends, this coronavirus exploded and it began to shape what we do. And suddenly we've got to learn all these new words. Until January or February, I had never heard much of a global pandemic. I was not aware of 1918 and how demanding that was. I had never heard about an N95 mask. I'd never known much or cared about quarantines, coronavirus tests, flattening the curve, drive-through testing, herd uh, down at the bottom right, the issue around herds and managing the herd, uh, which, uh, herd immunity, which is really interesting. Close contact is six feet. We're now in quarantine. Whoa, those words overwhelm me. My passion is how do you respond not only to the anticipated changes in these six areas, but to the jolt of the coronavirus and all these new words. It affects me personally. And again, we could stop right now and just spend the whole session on this. Everyone I know is affected in a very personal way. The emotions, the coping, and it's all different. Um, my wife and I are obviously, look here, we're older. Uh, and um, we have three children, each of whom have children. Uh, they are now in the United States, and I assume in Zimbabwe, homeschooling. Our daughters are very skilled and they're going crazy. It's affecting them in a big way. Their children can't go to the playground. They can't have friends over. They're not going to summer camps and now school is canceled. It's affecting them dramatically. And we as an organization are affected. Again, in a very different way. Some organizations are booming. I'm doing some work with Zoom right now and uh, Zoom is taking off because of this call. But many organizations like lodging and transportation are in trouble. So, 
here is my bias. Keep things simple. What are the opportunities and the challenges in a coronavirus world? And how do I keep things very, very simple? Before I go the next step, I'm going to stop, take a breath. I'm going to get one of the things I've learned. I hated and I still hate seeing myself on camera. I should have a raise of hands. How many of you hate seeing yourself on camera? Uh, uh, fortunate smiley. Fortunate you shouldn't hate yourself. Memory, you should not hate yourself. I've given up on that. That's the new world. Welcome to my office. It's a little bit messy. It's cluttered. Oh, the TV, uh, I have something in the background. I mean, that's the new world. But I'm going to stop. Memory, I don't know if there are any questions in the chat room or if anybody wants to raise their hand and ask a question. Let me just stop for a minute. Yeah, if, if there's anyone with a question, please uh, raise your hand and you can, uh, you, can, uh, you can unmute you so that you can uh, uh, ask a question. Memory, let me ask you a question yes. since you're my host. Thank you. Uh, if I go back to this slide and Memory, hold up your hand. You have a 10-point scale. <laughs> 10 points. Uh, okay. Zero to 10. How much has this coronavirus affected you and your family personally? Zero to 10. Nine. Wow. And I bet everybody on the call could hold up their hands and it's affecting all of us. It's putting pressure. How much is it affecting your business as a consultant and advisor? Nine as well. You get a nine, nine. Mm -hmm. By the way, if anybody on the call is holding up fewer than five fingers, get off the call <laughs> because you don't need our help. Um, we are all being affected. Um, it affects me personally as well. I get a little stir crazy, and uh, I'm sure some of you do, and it affects our business, as we all know. And yet we have to find a way through. Since I didn't see any questions, memory, is it okay if I go ahead? Yes, you're going you're gonna to proceed. Good. Let me give you my table of contents for the opportunities ahead. Uh, for those who don't know, my uh, PhD is in numerical taxonomy. I study statistics and try to make complex things simple. I believe there's three things that we in HR can do to create that value. One is navigate paradox. And I'll talk about that. Two is recognize the stages of a crisis. And three is continue to deliver HR in a more effective way by providing insight on talent, organization, and leadership. So let me unbundle that. And again, I confess I have a lot of material and uh, I hope you got the email to get the slides. Let me go next to paradox. We've talked about the assumption outside in, this jolt that shakes our lives in terms of crisis and response. Now let me go to paradox. A paradox is when there's two things that don't necessarily go together. I think about that as guardrails on a road. You've got one guardrail that may be long-term and another guardrail that may be short-term. And the answer is don't do one or the other, navigate between them. The balancing balls, you can't control the winds. And the example of sailing, you're always tweaking and navigating. If I were to draw a line between uh, an airport in Zimbabwe and an airport in Cape Town, the airline, the airport is not on that straight line very often. It's often going one side or the other as it flies to always kind of navigate those tensions. In the coronavirus world, we live in a state of paradox and we have to navigate them. For example, on the one hand, we want to care about the individual. And I see some folks in our HR field saying, oh, we've got to care about people. We're the caregivers. We're the caretakers. We care deeply about people. And we've got to attend to the organization's success. Again, the best thing we can give our people is an organization that wins. How do I in HR navigate that? We've got to be bold and short term. We've got to respond. We've got to make sure that we act. We get people working at home. We protect people. We're, we're, we're cutting costs. And we've got to shape long-term values. We've got to converge. We've got to focus. We've got to shed things that aren't relevant. And we've got to diverge. Resilient. Anyway, those paradoxes become a key to us in HR creating value. When I'm sitting at a business table and my business team is looking only at the short-term action, I need to raise the issue of long-term values. 
How do these day-to-day -day activities shape our long-term values? How does my organization go through that? I can help clarify those poles, those guardrails. I can look at the best outcome. I can see someone else's point of view. I engage in a debate. I find common ground and we act. I can help my organization navigate that paradox. And at an individual level, how can I help my leaders, whom I coach and nurture, manage? We've done a lot of writing and work on this, and there are others who are brilliant in this space. Help my, my leaders deal with complexity. Help my leaders see both sides. Help my leaders be socially endearing. Can we disagree without being disagreeable? Um, sometimes I get disagreeable. I know that my, uh, my colleagues from RPO would say that. I hope I don't. I hope we can disagree in a spirit of affection. Uh, we allow tension without contention. Can I be socially connected? To navigate paradox, can my leaders visit the shop floor? Can they visit with people? Am I personally aware of my predispositions? I tend to be an introvert, so I have to work at being an extrovert. I tend to be judging and make decisions quickly. I need to be slowed down. I need to not be bound by those. And finally, can I live from a set of values that others appreciate? All of those issues help me begin to navigate paradox. And let me go back. Navigating paradox is one of three categories of being able to respond in this, in this crisis. The paradox mindset for me is so critical. I'm in a company and they say, I say to the executives, what do we as an executive team, or I ask the executives, want to be known for as an executive team in the middle of this crisis? Caring, concerned, competent, wonderful. What's the paradox? Caring, concerned, and competent is more about that individual focus. We've also got to help our people recognize that the organization we're in has got to be successful. How do we navigate caring? with competitiveness. And my job in HR is to help business leaders recognize that and to help our organization recognize that. Now with that in mind, let me go to the next dimension. I've been asked to say, so what's this crisis like? And the best metaphor I could come up with uh, is not very complicated. Our son-in-law happens to be a doctor. Let's imagine he's driving down the road and he sees an accident. He pulls over. What does he do? He does first aid. He's a first responder. He reacts quickly. He stops the bleeding. He renders triage. I think in this coronavirus, it was a shock. Nobody expected it. Almost nobody saw it coming. Actually, what's really interesting is the people who saw it coming, they declared every month for a decade, a virus may happen, a virus may happen. When it finally comes, they say, I told you so. They didn't see it coming. Neither did I, neither did anyone else. Nobody did. The accident happened for whatever reason. In this virus, in corona, um, uh, coronavirus or COVID-19, we have to respond quickly. Individuals respond and companies respond. We're first aid. We react. We respond. We stop the bleeding. We work at home. We cut costs. We care for our people. Then in this accident metaphor, the ambulance shows up. And we begin to put the victim, or the, not the victim, the accident person, in an ambulance. And in the ambulance, the caregivers now, uh, who are the HR people, they say, you're okay. We're going to look at why you're bleeding. We're going to look a little bit deeper. So it's not just when you come work at home, let's manage your, your space and your, and your location. Let's figure out how what you're doing at home will help the company succeed. We'll source experts and, and memory doing this call so graciously as an example. Then we end up in the, health, in the hospital. Now in this accident metaphor, we're in the hospital. We're getting solutions to the malady. We're getting deep expertise. We're improving our processes. In this virus, some of us and some of our companies are now falling into routines. We're beginning to say, how are we going to learn to work? But we're still not back home. We're still sheltering. We're still socially distant. And finally, we go home. And now we begin to embed some learnings. Um, some of those learnings are a fundamentally new identity. Again, in this tragic accident metaphor, assume the uh, person who's injured has lost a limb. Then he or she has a fundamentally new identity. More often than not, when you come out of the hospital, I've had surgery, 
uh, one of our, our dear friends had a car accident recently and she bruised some ribs. She went through the accident ambulance, didn't go to the hospital very long. She comes home, she's got to adapt new insights. So here's why I like this metaphor. Wherever I am personally, am I in the accident phase, the ambulance transition phase, the hospital phase, or the home phase, look at where I am and what I need to do to learn and grow. Where is my organization? And the other reason I like some of this metaphor is I see some of my colleagues saying, um, we're in the new normal. No, we're not. <laughs> this is not normal. It's not normal to have headphones on and to be looking at my picture, talking to myself and hoping people are listening in Zimbabwe. It's not normal for you to be sheltered at home, training your children. It's not normal. We're not in a new normal till we get home. The ambulance, the hospital phase are not new normals. Okay, I'm going to do another stop for a second. I think I see a question in the chat box in memory if, you, if others have questions, and then I'll uh, try to take through this third piece, which is a lot of material. So let me just yes. stop and see if anybody wants to raise their hand or have a question. Yeah, if you go to the chat, there, there are quite a number of questions. Uh, uh, could you just pick what Memory pick two. Yeah. Uh, first one from Tadiwana, she says, a closer analysis of the model shows that it is mainly used by large, I think they're talking about the business partner model. Uh, uh, okay. Let me, uh, thank you for the question. <laughs> you know, the, the concept of where does HR add value, a lot of our research obviously comes from large firms. I think it has even more impact in smaller firms. In smaller firms, and, and we're a consulting firm with about 40 people, uh, other small medium enterprises under 500, the HR value added is more critical than ever because you can't hide. The talent, the leadership, the culture in a small firm is even more important. And until a company gets about 50 to 75 employees, there may not be a full-time dedicated HR person because the HR work is often done by the founder because he or she knows that the, the talent we bring in are the future of success. So I think small firms have even more power to begin to make this idea happen. One more question, then I'll go to the... Um, I think most of them were to do with the HR business partner model. Let me take one. What arguments can I use to convince my Chinese boss who strongly believe that this model is Eurocentric in nature? You know what? I'm gonna to come to that next. Let me uh, use that to go on. Yeah. I'm gonna go, do I have it here? I'm gonna to go, go to this slide, and then I'm gonna go backwards. Mm. There's a business meeting, and it could be a formal meeting with the HR people in a small business team in a small company. Finance talks about the economics, the numbers. Marketing talks about the people. Operation talks about the systems. When we look at our business leader, what is it we talk about in that meeting? And our suggestion is it's three things. The business partner model says, when I'm in any meeting, I wanna add value by talking about three things. Do we have the right talent? Do we have the right culture, the organization? And do we have the right leadership? Talent, culture, and leadership become the three things where we in HR provide unique value added to the business. Finance talks about money, uh, marketing talks about customers. We talk about talent, culture, and leadership in a way that creates value for customers, in a way that makes the systems work better. And the question about being a business partner, again, it starts with this logic of outside in, but then it says, and I'll go back here, the assumption, it responds to the outside world. We navigate paradoxes. We see the, uh, the stages of an accident. But then we talk about talent, leadership, and organization. And here's the insight. Which matters more to helping my company succeed in the marketplace? Is it talent, my five fingers, or is it organization, my fist? By the way, if you're willing on the call, which matters more? Hold up your fingers. This is talent. We have to fight the war for talent. This is organization. We have to build a better organization. Which matters more, your people or your organization? If you could just vote. Hold up one or the other, organization, fist, 
or talent. By the way, it's hard to do voting online, but we're doing it. I can't see all the votes, but uh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move quickly to see where people are voting. Resize window to display more votes. Okay, I'm learning how to do this. Oh, I see talent, talent. I see, I see Richard just growling at me. <clears throat> Richard's not happy. Richard's got to hold up one or the other. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend Richard. Ah, there's Richard. Come on, Richard, you got a great smile. You light up my life. I shouldn't have said that. That's inappropriate, Richard, but I, I, you held up talent. We did research on this, and here's what we found, is that in today's world, organization gets eight out of the 10 points. That if I'm going to be successful, if I'm going to be successful, I have to have great individual talent, but it's got to come together as a team. And the examples are legion. I know Zimbabwe has great football or soccer teams in the World Cup. 20% of the time, the leading scorer, he wins the golden boot, is on the team that wins the World Cup. That's true in any team sport, in basketball, in hockey. It's also true in movies. 20% of the time, the leading actor or actress is in the movie that wins movie of the year. This year, the Korean movie, and I've lost its name right now, the uh, bottom right. He was the leading uh, movie of the year, but they didn't have the leading actor or actress. But the director of the year is in that movie 80% of the time. And so these three areas, talent, culture, and leadership, come together to create value. With that in mind, I'm going to share a very quick slide or two. On what's happening? Uh, let me just stop for a minute. This is such a critical spot. People talk about the HR business model, um, and the message of the HR business model is really simple. When I engage with my business leaders or the employees in my company, I want to begin to connect to the outside in, the outside world, to help my company win in the marketplace, customers, investors. What do I uniquely bring to that discussion? Insights, wisdom, tools, actions on talent, or culture, and leadership. And when I bring that set of expertise, I help my business leaders, I help my organization build the right talent, leadership, and culture that helps us win in the marketplace. That's it. Now, it's not easy to do. Actually, the easiest way to do it is to have memory come work with you. I was supposed to say that twice. So memory, I've said it once. And hopefully to have the RBL group. I'm going to do something a little bit risky here. Memory, if you could unlock Michael Phillips and Jessica Johnson. Michael and Jessica are part of our firm right now. Um, Michael or Jessica, would you add anything to what I've just said? They did not know I was going to do this. So <laughs> and I'm not sure we've unlocked him. <laughs> Actually, yeah, yeah. I what may have happened is Mike, they may have signed oh, on. Michael, Michael is, is Michael is on, yeah. Michael? Do you have anything yes. to add, Michael? Well, you know, I just love everything that we're talking about. And I want to step back just a little bit. And, and a couple of things have happened this week and everybody that I've been talking to. And we've been going back to that original theme you've been discussing, Dave. It's like the number one thing we've got to do is make sure that there's a company for people to stay working for and going back to. And as we've seen some statistics, at least in the United States this morning, 22 million people have gone on to unemployment in just the past month. And those are levels that we haven't seen since the depression. And there's nothing we can do in HR if we do not have employees and we don't have people coming to help us. So this thinking from the outside in, making sure that we have the company in a position, the organization in a position to stay in business so that we can take care of our people. Another, another thought that's come to me, very often we hear people saying things about, well, I can't go to work. I think we've got to help our people understand that work is a thing that we do, not a place that we go. And we can do our work from anywhere. And one of our goals in HR is to make sure we're giving people the tools and the support that they need to do their work no matter where they are. Not go to work, but do the work. And so if we align these two things and then make sure that the organization is built in such a way that we're taking care of that, that's our responsibility. And I just want to reinforce everything you've said, Dave. 
Uh, Michael, thank you. Uh, Jessica, I'll pass. I'll come back to you later with time. But Michael, I love that second comment. I, I hear people saying, oh, I'm working at home. The boundaries of work have almost always been physical. I go to work. I'm at work. I'm from work. Blow it up. I think this is going to be a fundamental change. It doesn't matter where you work as long as the work that you do creates value for your customer. The boundaries of work are not physical, a place. They're values. Does my work in an airplane, does my, the first book I wrote was called Organizational Capability with Dale Lake. We dedicated it to the Toshiba computer without whom we could not have written the book because we wrote the book on airplanes. Um, I, the boundaries of work are not physical. They're value-based. Anyway, Michael, thank you. There's three things in HR we bring to this value discussion, talent, leadership, and culture. I'm going to give you a one or two slide overview on these and you have more detail, Michael, and, and the rest of us in, in memory has tools. That's my second time to do it. In talent, we've got to answer five questions. In competence, A, we bring people in, bringing new people in. B, we move people through. We train. We do performance. And C, we appropriately remove people and retain people. D, we keep our employees committed and engaged to give their best effort. And E, we help them find meaning and purpose. Even in this coronavirus, we've got to manage A, B, C, D, and E. In fact, if not, even more. Next, we've got to manage our organization. And here's what the organization has got to look like. This metaphor is fascinating. Uh, there's a beach. This was a couple of years ago now. A woman's on the beach with her two sons, eight and 10. They go, two boys go in the water. They get caught in a riptide. They're pulled out. The mother jumps in. The grandmother jumps in. Four or five people from the shore jump in. And now there's seven or eight people in the riptide. I've never been in a riptide. I've been told by those who have, it's frightening. You're pulled into the water. You don't know what to do. Within two or three minutes, you can see about 80 people joined arms on the shore. They held hands. They joined arms. And they rescued those people. What a cool story. That's the metaphor for what our organization should be. And I love your question or the question memory people were asking. That's what a small company does. They're agile. They're quick. They're moving. We've discovered what that company looks like. And again, this is way too busy as a slide, but that company is not focused on hierarchy and rules. Who's accountable? Those people joining arms didn't say, oh, who's going to join arms? Who's tall? Who's short? Who can swim? It's not about systems. It's not about capability even. It's about a market system that helps us respond. And Arthur Young and I have just done a book on that of what that new organizational form looks like. And then the third piece we manage is leadership. <sighs> Leaders, leadership. We can all look back in our personal lives and say, who was a leader who shaped my life? By the way, in my office, I have a, uh, a couple of posters. Uh, I should say the leaders who shaped my life, I have Martin Luther King, who was a leader in my young life, who shaped me, Sheikh Zayed, whose work I so admire. Um, I'll add this one. Uh, this is my mother. Uh, this is my younger brother. <laughs> no, that's me. And this is my sister. My mother is probably one of the leaders who shaped my life the most. Uh, I haven't shown this book before. That's my mother when she was young and sexy. <laughs> That's my mother with some of her grandchildren. And we have a book of my mother and her life. And, and I'm so grateful. I haven't done this before, but those are some of my ancestors whom I didn't know. I live out their lives. I am shaped by the leaders in my life, as are all of it, and each of us, each of you. But in a company, what Norm Smallwood and I discovered is that leadership is not just what we do inside. It's not our competencies. It's outside. It's not just who we are as a person. It's what we establish in the organization. We combine those into a metaphor of a leadership brand. A brand is an identity. A brand is, is an image in the marketplace that shapes, shapes behavior. Leadership brand is an identity. And we identified in our work on leadership brand six steps to creating that leadership brand. And I'm not going to take you through the details. Again, get the slides gbitter at rbl.net or contact RBL Michael Phillips. 
at rbl.com or Jessica Johnson or others, we have tools and slides that we can work with to do that. Take a breath. I've now given you three simple things that we can work on in HR to create value in crisis. We navigate the paradoxes. We manage this inherent tension. I like, I hadn't seen the data Michael just shared. 22 million people in the United States unemployed. I'm sure Zimbabwe has the same issues. You got to care for the people and you got to build a competitive organization. There are stages. There are stages. The jerk stage, the emergency stage, the ambulance uh, or the, the accident, the ambulance, the hospital, where many of us are. We're trying to create routines in this world. And then we're going to eventually come to a new normal. And there's HR. Now I'm going to give you a slide that's going to confuse you to no end. And I apologize, and I don't know how to make this more simple. At each of those four stages, first aid, where we do triage, we assess, we react. Ambulance, we offer support, we diagnose. Hospital, we get experts, we get our processes and routines in place, we solve the problems. And the new normal, those are the phases. Our job in HR is to deliver talent, leadership, and organization in each of those phases. That leads me to 12 cells. And again, <laughs> we're now working at the pace of change. I came up with this. In fact, it's funny. Uh, I, uh, a magazine or a, public, a publisher said, we'd like to publish, and I shared some of the articles I'm doing. They said, no, we want fresh ideas. So I wrote them back at one o'clock this morning. I said, the article that I published or posted on LinkedIn on Tuesday at eight o'clock, I finished writing Monday night at 10 o'clock. That's as fresh as it comes. It's got typos and flaws. I think in this world, we are creating and experimenting and innovating to navigate stability and, and experimentation. So this framework is fairly new, but there's 12 cells. When you look at the slides, rate yourself, red, yellow, green. Green, I've mastered that cell. One, two, and three. I know how to manage the first aid emergency. Four, five, and six. I can begin to manage the transition. Green or yellow, I'm getting there. Red, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That's where I've got to go next. And I in HR can deliver talent, leadership, and organization depending on where we are as an organization. Now let me come to my last part, and I know I've covered a lot. So what does this mean for me in HR? What does this mean for me in HR? Let me go through this and then we'll have uh, four or five minutes for questions if people have them and I can see there's some in the, the chat room. Let me start with a, a long list and you can go to my uh, LinkedIn site or at rbl.com and get the, I did something I've never done before and I probably will never do again. And I produced 10 60 second videos that are meant to help people and organizations learn 10 skills to navigate this paradox. Our job in HR is to embed those skills. Now, I won't take you through all 10, I could quickly. Are we always learning? This is a chance of great experimentation, great learning. Uh, let me give one example of learning always in that first column with personal. My wife, who's a great psychologist, and. And I'm realizing in my office, I should have more pictures of my wife than uh, my heroes and my, my, my mother and my sister. But um, boy, I just confessed something I hope she doesn't listen to. Uh, I'm sure she's not noticed. Actually, she's probably noticed. Um, now I've got to find a picture of my wife. Hang on, just so you can see. That's our uh, family. And, and obviously, my wife is a beautiful woman here with our grandkids. So I do have a, a picture of my wife. So I am able to continue this session. She taught me a lesson at the individual level with learning. Think of a thing, an experience in your life that did not work, that was a failure. How did you feel at the time? For me, there was a job I wanted, I didn't get promoted, I was a failure, I was lost, I was incompetent, I couldn't do things. Now think about how much that experience that didn't work has led to who you become today. Out of that difficult experience for me, I learned resilience, I learned a focus. I learned the capacity to grow. It changed who I am. Make learning real. Anticipate the stages of a crisis so you can move forward. Make working at home work that Michael talked about. Distance socially, but don't isolate. I could keep going. And the final one, number 10, I think my most critical question for everyone I coach, 
are you taking care of yourself? Because unless and until we take care of ourselves, we can't take care of others at a personal level, help our leaders take care of themselves. In terms of competencies for HR, I don't want to bore you with our research. Let it be said, we've done 30 years of research with 90,000 people. Memory's been a partner before. He will be again. Uh, we were going to do the set eighth round of our research in February, but the crisis happened. We're going to probably start in June or July. Let memory know. Love to work with you. Here's some of the new skills that we identified actually last fall in this January before the crisis. Learn to analyze information and create information asymmetry. Separate signal from noise. Offer guidance. Critical issue that we're working on so aggressively. Anticipate solutions. Be good social citizens. We're learning the skills of HR to go forward. That's it. I've covered six things with some action items. I'm going to highlight them, show you again how to access slides, and then see if we have a few minutes for questions. Rethink our assumptions about HR. It's not what we do, it's what people get, it's outside in. Recognize this jolt of the coronavirus and learn to master paradox, see the stages, uh, deliver HR talent. Navigate the paradoxes, navigate those paradoxes for individuals and organizations. Improve at all four stages of this accident or crisis, the accident, the ambulance, the hospital, the home. Deliver talent, leadership, and organization at each of those stages. And finally, recognize 10 tips for the individual and competencies for HR. With that in mind, if you want slides, send Ginger a note. Um, uh, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, we have three or four minutes for questions. So, Memory, let me uh, go to you for questions people might have. And, Jessica, okay. I think I'm going to have to pass just for sake of time. Uh, yeah. So, memory. I don't have any questions. Super. Let's ask, let's ask the, the, the participants if there are any questions. Please put your and questions. If you could, memory, if you could unlock Jessica. Uh, I think that's I a did. horrible thing to say. If you, okay, Jessica, uh, while people are thinking about questions, Jessica, my colleague at RBL, anything that you would like to add? got unmuted. <laughs> um, you know, Dave, I was thinking about those stages of the accident that you talked about. And I think we have a tendency um, to focus very uh, distinctly on the stage that we're in. But if we can take some time to step back and think about the next stage we'll be going to and try and be, um, you know, anticipate that and be intentional about options for that next stage. We may not know when we get back to home, right? When that's going to happen and, uh, and we'll get to our new normal. But if we can kind of think about some options for that, I think that helps us. You know, I love it, Jessica, thank you. Um, I did a piece on, I wrote it Monday night at 10 and posted it Tuesday on LinkedIn. I think Jessica, one of the things that I am personally struggling with is the ability to live in uncertainty. I, I want clarity. <laughs> I want clarity. Tell me when it's going to end. Tell me when I can go to a movie. Tell me when I can watch a basketball game. Tell me when I can, oh, I'm going to get emotional. Tell me when I can hug one of these grandkids. And the answer is, we don't know. We don't know. And you know, that's such a hard place to live because, and so what do you do in that world? You focus on what you can do. I can do FaceTime with my grandkids. And now we're hugging through faith. One of my grandsons named Daniel is about a year and a half old, and we bump heads on the computer screen. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool, and he giggles, and I giggle. I giggle more than he giggles. I don't have certainty, and I think that's such a critical one for me. And, and Jessica, I think that's really helpful. You know, memory, it's time to end. I'm going to end with four words, and it's my confidence in us as an HR profession and in us as HR people. And here they are. The best is yet ahead. I gave myself five words. <laughs> the best is yet ahead. I always believe that the best is yet to come. May we in HR be dedicated to making that happen. And let memory work with you. Get the notes from Ginger G. Bitter. Contact Michael or Jessica at rbl.net. Let us know how to help us collectively move forward in this great time. Memory, thank you so much. I've enjoyed the discussion.